ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another episode of the Typical Skeptic Show. I think you guys are going to be amazed at what we're talking about today. It, uh, you know, we went from talking about aliens and alien abduction and the contact experience. And now we're going to be talking about spirituality, metaphysics, uh, miraculous healings, remote viewing, dreams, uh, uh, shamanistic things. Um, and I have an amazing guest to do it. I have someone who's really been in the field that um, that's that's revered in this field uh, for decades. Gail Hasen has been a subject and contributor to scientists in the paranormal and psi research field. She has led an unconventional life and found herself accepted into other cultures just by being herself. Gail Hasen will discuss her work with shamans, miraculous healings, remote viewing, dreams that help solve mysteries, and she will talk about what it was like to be a test subject for scientific research in the field of metaphysics. Now, let me tell you a little bit more about her. Gail Hasen has had a paranormal experience since she was a teenager. Gail attended the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969, appears in the World's Woodstock documentary, and is featured in the recent book, 50 Years of Peace and Music. Today in the research community, Gail is known as a telepath, psychic and remote viewer, someone who accurately sees distant or future events. The chapter on telepathy on Dr. Dean Radin's international bestseller, Supernormal, describes one of the many successful paranormal experiments with Gail as a subject. She has contributed to many experiments and papers on paranormal phenomena. In the 1970s, entrepreneur Werner Earnhardt presented Gail at events to promote the mind dynamics seminars that evolved into Earnhardt Seminars Training, or EST. Gail has been welcomed into indigenous cultures, including the Hiloquili of Mexico, the Haida of Alaska, and the Shamans of Mongolia. In 2012, she was initiated in the Mongolian Baraya Shaman. In 2014, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from Mongolia's National Academy of Sciences. Wow, that's amazing. And she's also been featured in Dean Radin's uh, chapter on telepathy, Woodstock, and uh, a bunch of other stuff. Um, she, uh, thank you for, Gail, thank you for coming on my show. How are you? I'm good. I just have to give you a couple little uh, corrections so people will know uh, that uh, one particular group is called the Weecholes. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, so right. Weechol, right? So just so that the audience knows for sure who we were discussing. <laughs> well, how did you end up getting yourself in? What? What? what uh, where? Where would we start? Because you have such a dynamic life and you've had dynamic experiences. I kind of want to try to cover it all. Um, I, should we talk about the remote viewing first or how the remote viewing even started? Should we start from the beginning when you were a child? Uh, do, you, do, you, do, you have, do you have childhood psychic and paranormal experiences? Well, first off, I just want to say that I have so many stories that I know from the amount of topics that you just shared with the audience, there's no way in our one hour time together that we're going to be able to touch on all those because I have too many stories. <laughs> Is there any way you could take me like, from what I just mentioned, could you take me on through a journey? If you, if you were, if you were, if you could, like, if you took me, if you like, kind of covering a little bit of it all. Or do you, do you well, know? let's see, I'll give you, I'll, I'll try to do a small, like, I'll try to do a little timeline. Maybe that'll be helpful. Yeah. It's part of the way of saying these things. Uh, when I was a child, you know, six, seven um, I used to have a lot of astral travel kind of experiences that I remember very well, leaving my body and, you know, like going around my house and seeing everyone else sleeping, including myself. Those stayed with me and I found I could do that later in life in my 20s and see things by just sort of leaving my body and traveling. Just that later in life, I learned I could travel more than just in my house. I could travel to places far farther from here. In my teenage years, um, I was having uh, experiences of dreams and knowing things, but I had not ever had like any kind of training until I attended this mind dynamics course in San Francisco, of course, it's always California. And I'd come from New York and was with my family and my dad and my brothers and my boyfriend. And we took this mind expansion course in the 70s you have to know there was a lot of these self-help and mind expansion things going on so that people were um exploring all different mo different modalities of spiritual things and it was very big then so everyone was searching and seeking for 
different in different avenues, whether it was the Hare Krishna or, you know, there were just different things people were going towards. So we fell into this mind dynamics thing and it taught you, which was the sales pitch when they were selling it to you, it taught you in two weekends how to be able to access information at a distance by working on ill people with sicknesses that needed healing. So you would learn how with just being told the name, the age and the city, a way of going into a workshop in your mind and seeing that person and then doing a distant healing on them, whichever way you saw fit, whether it was light or immersing them in water or whatever you felt was the way that you thought this person needed healing for the sickness that you would see at a distance. And you'd be verified by the other person who was holding the card that whole, had the information of what the illness was of the person. So I was 15 and a half when I started doing that. And I ended up staying with them until I was about 17. And I did these, what they called cases then. I would do these cases for them. And I was, my brothers and I were one of the few children that actually went to the beginning courses of this uh, mind dynamics. So it was really all adults that we were with. Later on, I think they made courses to do things with children. But in the beginning, we were the only young kids that did this kind of um, course. So I, um, Became, I was, became very good at it and I was very good at it before I finished the course. So I was able to do the things they were teaching and it gave me tools and I loved the thought of being able to do work to heal other people. So that sort of just became something that I was just natural at. It wasn't a, I didn't have to like practice to become good at this. It's just that the more I did it, more information came and um, in the beginning, like most people see like colors or black darkness, say the person has liver cancer or something, they might be drawn to that part of the in invisible body and see a dark blackness near there, knowing that there was something wrong in that area. After doing them for like a year, I was able to tell things, I, I would be able to tell them the actual um, uh, pharmaceutical drugs that would be inside the person's bloodstream at the time. And I was just a teenager who would never know what kind of thing you needed for, you know, uh, statins or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. It was, and at 17 and a half, I had a very bad experience with this. And it's basically scared the shit out of me. And it was a... Um, Kind of a possession thing and I think it came from a dying person who I was working on trying to heal and the reason that these things can happen is because we were not taught how to really protect ourselves in going into these kind of situations. Now I'm, <laughs> I've been through so much different experiences I don't have that fear now but at that time when I was feeling the energy of something else trying to take over me in, a, in that kind of a way I had to do an exorcism and I found no help from the mind dynamics people or Werner Earhart. And, you know, here I'd done all this volunteer work for them. And when I needed them, they were not there. And so I decided I would never do that kind of work ever again. And I never did any kind of planned, organized, psychic, remote, whatever thing. But for the next... Wait, can I stop you there? Maybe we can yeah. I, have, I have a question. When you were doing the healing on the person, do you think that actually opens you up so entities can enter your body? Like, it, it, I don't think it was other entities. I think it was specifically the person's bodies I was contacting. That this particular guy was dying of emphysema. Yeah. And I feel like something about him was like attaching on to me in a way. It's, maybe maybe an entity was attached to him and it was trying to attach to you. Like, are we talking like a demon here? Or are we talking like some kind of... No, no. I feel like it was the persons themselves that were dying that were like looking to grasp on to life. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. Right, yeah, no, yeah. right. No demons. No, nothing. No, not, nothing like that. And I was doing many of these bodies, you know, that were very sick people. But in this experience, if I go into a long, lengthy story, this will be the only thing we talk about. So I'm trying to make it short, but... 
That's fine. Uh, I just I'm gonna. I, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah whatever. So what ended up happening was um, I spoke to my father, and he instructed me that I needed to you know, I guess we could call the, the word exercise or whatever, Ex, you know, I needed to get this thing out of my space and tell it to go away that 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 I was not there to give them life. And um, it was a powerful experience. And I did this in the night. And it felt like a dream, but I had all my senses in the dream. And when the entire thing was over, this whole process, uh, everything was calm in my house again, and I felt no more energy of somebody like on my left shoulder here trying to invade into inside, inside of me. So for the next 40 years, or let's see, I was 17 then, and I met them when I was 39, 40. So up until my early, late 30s, early 40s, the only thing that I ever did was anything that happened natural for me. None of this, like, what I was doing then, getting a person's name, doing a reading, you know, how what was wrong with them. Instead, I just let whatever naturally comes to me, which are precognitive things, dreams, things, uh, having gut level feelings when something scary might be happening to someone or getting a message ahead that it's going to happen to them. I'm always in communication with death for whatever reason. When somebody's about to die, somehow I end up getting somehow contacted and know that they're dying then, or my body physically feels like it. So all the different things that have happened have just been what I call the natural things, not where I'm sitting there saying, oh, I want some information. It's more like just whatever happened. And I had a plenty of stories for 40 years up until then. And that's when I met Dean Radin and Russell Targ. And it was the first time I ever considered doing anything with my so-called, some people call it gifts or whatever, whatever the word is. It's for me, it's just being me. And so it was the first time that I decided that, oh, this was for science. This wasn't to do anything where someone was gonna make money off of me. This was something where it was going to help people to understand what some of these experiences can be like by doing, participating as a subject with these two scientists in their research of called, which was called remote viewing. So that was when I decided, and that was, we met in 1998 at Interval Research. And they asked me, my, my husband submitted my name when they were looking for subjects by sharing a story with them about, you know, my wife wakes up in the morning and says, oh, the, the uh, cleaning lady won't be coming today. She'll, she, she can't come, her son is throwing up and he's sick. And then my husband, who's a scientist, MIT and Yale, so he's you know, a very highly intelligent man. And he says, the phone rings and it's the cleaning woman saying, I'll have to come next week. My son is throwing up, he's, he's sick. So he told them that story and said, would you want her to come in? And they said, yes, that's the kind of person we're looking for. So a whole new world opened up for me because of my husband introducing me to these two men who were all working in the same company that was founded by Paul Allen called Interval Research. And it was a think tank. And they were conducting um, experiments in remote viewing and other paranormal research. And I went to their office and I gave a two hour talk on an, a 10 page list of all the psychic things I could try to remember that had happened in my life because they wanted to know what those things were. And after they finished, they told me I should write a book, which I have out in manuscript right now, a small medium at large. And, um, and I've been doing a subject with them or a participant or an assistant since then to, to this day. So that's how I got back into this world of the paranormal or parapsychology. I'm not sure what, what area or label you'd put me into, but I've done experiments now for all these different scientists and they're all considerate, caring people. They're not like the experience I had as a teenager. And, um, and I'm very happy that I've been able to give them, you know, good data for experiments we've done. You know, sometimes you do something and you don't give good data, but it's not, you know, it's not, I'm not, the, you know, just like a famous ball player or anybody else. I'm not somebody that every single time, it always gives them great info. It's not every single time, but it's enough times that it's, important to add to statistical data. That's awesome. Now, uh, what I wanted to say was uh, there are people who have two different schools of remote viewing. 
there's um I had Lynn Buchanan on my show and he oh, very nice man. Yeah, but he learned it a little bit different way. He told me that control he does what something called controlled remote viewing. And he thinks that anybody can learn this. He said it's like learning karate. He said you have to practice it over and over and over again. Whereas someone like you, you have a natural inclination for psychic ability. So it probably comes to you a little bit easier. You might be doing a different kind of remote viewing. Is there a difference? Or Well, all I can say is I can't answer the other uh, ways that the remote viewing is done because yeah. it works in different ways for other people. I can only speak about my experience, which is I met Russell. We went into my husband's office. He said, make yourself comfortable. And I said, I'd like to lay on the floor if I'm going to be comfortable and close my eyes. And he said, I want you to think about the picture you're going to be shown at three o'clock on the computer from a collection of 300, I think it was, National Geographic sites around the world. We want you to draw the photo that will be coming up. It has not been picked yet. A random number generator will select the photo. And I don't know what it is, he said, no one knows what it is, but we want you to draw now at one o'clock what the three o'clock photo will be. So I sat there with a pencil and I did my stick figure drawings because I draw like somebody in kindergarten. I have to write on the side what it is so they'll know if it's like a building or <laughs> my little squiggle, you know, I'm not a, where, where some of these, you know, these remote viewers happen to be artistic people or whatever. So they can draw these beautiful things or they were an architect or whatever. And I can't do that. <laughs> yeah. And I was able to draw the picture that came up at three o'clock. Now, this was not something I knew I could do until that day. So I've never taken a remote viewing course, but I've had the finest remote viewing guide, Russell Targ, to take me through the remote viewing um, process. process. And he has a way of just making you feel completely relaxed and comfortable and just tell him what you see. And we've just had a great relationship of this over the years. In fact, he called me a couple of weeks ago, maybe it was a month ago, we were doing some stuff. I'll have to tell you about the apps my husband made for him later in case people want to know about remote viewing. Uh, but my, he said to me, I have something in my hand right now. Can you tell me what it is? And I said, oh, it's a, it's like a sparkler. It's something that you hold in your hand and lovely, colorful lights comes out from this sparkler. And I see all the colors, red and yellow and blues. And I said, it's just like that, like a magical sparkler. So he said to me, well, you're 99.9% .9 right. I'm going to send it to you. So I'm going to show you what it was. I have to put it in here. Pardon me for a second there. So here's the device that he was holding. Can you see it? Yeah, what, it, it, well, it's, uh, what is that? It's just somebody that was famous in the Apple or the computer world decided to make LED color little light things. It's just a color light thing that you could just put up on your door or something, you know. And it, yeah. Things, but it, it is something you hold in your hand and it does have colorful lights coming up. And it had reminded me as I was looking at it, like something like a sparkler. That's so this, this is an interesting, right. So this is, and that's not, it wasn't a remote view. He just said, what's in my hand? Yeah. Can I do that every time? No, but with him, I seem to have very good results. That's, so, that's really cool. Um, where were we? So anyhow, so. Oh, I, I wouldn't I, ask I'm not you. a trained remote viewer. Yeah, but I have participated in remote viewing with uh, Stephen Schwartz and with Dean and Russell, and I've done things for other people in experiments when they would come through um, the Institute of Noetic Sciences because I spent a couple of years volunteering and working there. So I would participate in experiments there with different noted people that came through. Now, were you able to? You were able to find missing people. I've only done that twice and I've never wanted to do it after I did it twice. Um, one time I did it was a spontaneous thing where I received a phone call from a psychiatrist in Berkeley 
who had a client there and he had read my book, um, my manuscript, The Small Medium at Large. And he said, I'm gonna call you one day. And I was in my house doing dishes in the kitchen and he called me up and said, I've got this client, his mother's been missing for eight days. We wonder if you know where she is. And I was like, I've never looked for a missing person. I don't know if I could do this. Yeah, yeah. I was you know, on the spot. So he gives me this, this the, the young man who was in his like early twenties. And I say to him, so you, how long has your mother been missing? And he said, it's been eight days. And I said, Is she, was she very sick? Did she have cancer? He said, no, no, she was very, very healthy. And I said, well, what happened? He said, she moved to Colorado to go live with her boyfriend. And I went out to see her for Christmas. And then she sent me a Christmas gift of $700 in the mail, which I couldn't believe because she has no money. And he said, and then when I called to thank her, we've never been able to reach her since then. So I said, well, what do you feel? You're her son. You're more psychically connected than anyone else here. You're her closest person. And he said, I, I feel like, you know, I don't know if she's still with us. And I said, well, you just should trust your gut feeling. While he's asking, answering these questions, I'm seeing his mother dead on the side of a road in a car with her head like an arm slumped over the steering wheel. Oh my and God. Like, boulders on the side and I didn't know where this came from I've never done a missing persons thing so I said to him you know trust your thing let me speak to the doctor again so the psychiatrist gets back on and I said to him I'm having an anxiety and panic attack right now I said I actually saw a woman dead on the side of the road in a car I said and I don't know if it's real or if I'm contacting her or what I said, but I'm not going to say to him, your mother's dead. I don't even know this person. And uh, he said to me, no, thank you. We're really happy that you, whatever. And I told him what I saw with the boulders and the things. And then he calls me back three hours later. And he says, the Colorado police just found her body. And it was in a car on the side of the road. There were boulders. And she was slumped over a steering wheel. They think that it's foul play and they asked me to contact you. Mind you, they didn't find her because of my information. It's just that he told them my information matched what they found. So they felt maybe I knew something else about the case. So they asked, could you find, ask her if she feels there's foul play? And it wasn't something I even had to think about. I just like knew with like a very strong conviction. I said, no, there was no, I had no scary feelings about this. I said, when I went and found the site, I, I just felt that, you know, there was no blood, no feelings of violence, nothing like that. I said, it didn't feel anything negative at all. I'm just sure there's no one else involved in her death. So he's held that back to the Colorado police. And then he calls me the next day to say that when they went back to her home and went searching through her stuff and when the table and whatever, they found a, a letter that she had written to her family. She had been diagnosed with cancer, like the first question that I had asked him. And it was an eerie, eerie, you know, there was nothing you could do. It was a cancer where she couldn't even receive treatment. She was just going to die very shortly. And she did not want to torture her family and go through that expense. She had no money. She rather just take her life and not put everyone through all that trauma because there was no hope that she was going to survive or there was no cure that there was no chemo. There was nothing that she could do. It was found too late. So he said, thank you. Thank you for what you did to talking to the young man. And we appreciate it. So that one, it was a spontaneous thing. I didn't, as I said, I was doing dishes. It wasn't even like, this, this is how I operate. I'm not like, a, yeah. I'm not your whatever. I don't know. Can I get your opinion on something? Through all your, your years of sight research, like in, in the in studies of the mind, how psychic are us natural, are us, humans that aren't as a giftedly is gifted is giftedly inclined as you like what areas of psychic can we reach and now let me give you an example say i have someone in my family that is sick or that i feel like needs healed but they don't want to take my advice on certain things like they just want to go the natural they're not, not the natural way the way that they're waiting for answers for their doctors but i have things that i feel like let me just put it this way. I, I think I know someone who might have cancer, 
So I've, I've suggested medicinal mushrooms because I know that they can act as like a defense response. You know what I mean? But do you think us, can we naturally heal people we know close to us if we meditate or do you have to have certain abilities? Okay. I'm going to answer that with two things, which one thing is for myself, I, I believe that everybody has these traits inside of them. It's just how much they've stopped listening to their inner voice or how many shoulds that come up in front of them so that the information doesn't come through. I think that when we have a lot of um, uh, filters in front of us, it makes it harder. It's not that it's not there or accessible for everybody, it is. I don't think you have to be, I mean, it's my personal feeling. I think everybody does have these experiences. It's just whether they've shared it with you or they've been allowed to say it because they may be embarrassed by it or because they might think it's crazy. But I know anyone who's experienced deaths of loved ones, people who are twins, mothers, anyone like this has an instant connection and a psychic level to those family members and people. And it's just, you know, you always, they always say, oh, the mother knew this or the mother had a feeling. Well, everybody is that way. It's just a matter of how much it gets shut down for you by being told that that's not right or going to schools or, or religious practices or things that say that those really, you know, the work of the devil. I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, exactly. So you're saying we do all have some kind of natural, yeah, it's, it's worth trying, right? I mean, well, I'll tell you two scientific responses to that, which is one Dean Radin, who is just one of the most amazing scientists doing work uh, you know, in parapsychology and in this research and doing, you know, he's really doing the top stuff these days. Well, he said to me the other day, we were talking about, um, he's going to be on my podcast. In fact, in Russell's next, my next podcast, and he's my other one. Um, we were talking about, he was gathering data, you know, statistical data, and he was trying to get, you know, you have to have the control group and then say, say you have 50 psychics. Well, then you need 50 people who aren't psychic to have the control group, right? Well, he said he could, he had the hardest time finding anyone who could not say in their entire life they hadn't had at least one psychic type experience. He said it was almost impossible to find a person like that. So that's the answer part one to your question. And then part two, the question about healing we, I participated in a paper that he has published in the journal Explore. And I can't remember because it's a long title, but it's the compassionate uh, something or other with partners in cancer. And what it was, was they would take couples where one person had the cancer and one person didn't have the cancer. And the person who didn't have the cancer, even though they'd never really ever done this in, this, in their life, there would be a set time where the person would have to do a meditative love healing kind of energy toward their partner. And all the partners who had the person who did that healing energetic thing, those had less trips to the hospitals, a reduced amount of ne necessary medications for their cancers, showed a definite swing toward a more getting better than getting worse, where the ones that had the placebos were, were then their cancers and things were either still going, getting worse or the same as it was, but it didn't show things on the you know plus side. So there you're showing that people who have nothing but the love and care of the person that they're seeing that's dying or very ill from cancer, and they're the ones giving the, the healing energy, the meditative focus. They're not trained healers. They're not people that are running around doing Reiki on other people. They're just a regular couple, and they're seeing significant change in those people's uh, diseases of cancer when they had the partner send love and meditative healing to them. So I hope that answers that other part of your question. That does. That definitely does. That's amazing. Now, I'd like to get into some of your experiences with table tipping and spoon bending. That's the most notes Michelle wrote to me. Like, what have you, what is, uh, I know what spoon bending is, and I remember that from the PK man. I interviewed a uh, What's Jeff that? Mishlove? Yeah, Dr. Mishlove. And the PK man was amazing. Have you done stuff like that? Have you been by Ben Spoons? Well, I, I, I leave this out here. 
I am not a bender like this. People who are really benders, like, yeah. and I've, I've seen it. I can tell you a whole story about when I did my spoon, my fork, but couldn't do a spoon, but I did this fork. So I, I think you can see it. Wow. Um, and this was all done at, a, so it's, I'm just gonna twirl it around so you can see that it's hard to do that twice with a fork. So are you able to see that? Yeah. Yeah, so that's twirled around twice. So it's like this. Now, what, what kind of state do you have to get into to be able to do that? Well, I, all I can do is explain to you how this one happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was at an International Remote Viewing Association conference, and um, there was a man named J um, Jack Hoke or Huck. These are all you know people in Buchanan. I think all those people would know him. And uh, he's passed away. But at that time, he would throw these spoon bending parties at these conferences. And, you know, the conferences are in a hotel, so it's usually a ballroom situation. And uh, we were in this large ballroom and anyone was welcome to come. You know, it was one of the evening activities after you've heard all the talks. So I think maybe 150 people were in this room. And on the floor, is a tablecloth that's covered with spoons and forks. And Jack says to everybody, uh, you need to go up and walk around and as you're looking at the silverware, pick the fork or spoon that calls to you. And you would go around and you'd pick that and then go and sit back in your seat. So then everybody goes and sits back in the seat and I'm holding my spoon in the seat. And we're waiting for everyone to finish picking. And there's a little old woman behind me just she looked like your classic school teacher, little lady with a you know a little gray hair and a little bonnet and everything, a little bun, I mean, in the back. And I look at her and she's holding the spoon like this and we haven't even started the class and her spoon is just bending over in half like this. She's just holding it like this in her hand and it's just going over. Oh my God. And until that moment, I had heard about spoon bending, but... I'm not a skeptic. I just don't feel like until I see it myself, I can't say for sure yeah. whether I think it's real or not. So I didn't know whether spoon bending was a real thing. I just said, I'll go and see if I could do it. So when her spoon starts bending, I start screaming out in the audience for the Jack to come and take a look. And he comes over and he says, yes, this is, you know, this is, this is what I'm talking about. And we ask her, you know, have you been doing this for years or how come, you, you know, how did you do that? And she says, oh, no, I'm just a retired school teacher. But one of my students, I think it was Paul Smith. I'm not sure. One of my students is here. And I wanted to see what he's doing now late in life. So I came to just, just drop in and say hello. And this was going on. So I decided to sit here. But I never knew anything about doing this. So then I'm sitting there and I'm holding my spoon. I'm thinking to myself, my God, I'm involved with all this stuff and I can't bend a spoon, but this little lady behind me is just bending like that. You know, what attack, What do you do for this? How do you have that kind of talent? So then I decide to put the spoon back and I said, it mustn't be my, my, my spoon. And I walk around and I say, ugh, there was a fork that called me. So I got the fork. So what he tells you to do is while you have the fork or the spoon in front of you, you scream at it bend, bend, bend. But you have to remember the energy of 150 people are screaming this at the same time. So you're creating like a, an energy in, in the room. And then he says, you take your hand, your finger, and you, you rub on the metal like this. And you're rubbing gently like this on the fork or on the, you know, on the handle part. And all of a sudden, this is what I experienced. It was like the metal turned into liquid. And it was almost like I could see molecules or atoms or something. And when it felt like it was liquid and fluid, that's when I just twirled it around. And it was effortless. It wasn't like I was going, oh, can I bend it? Oh, no. No, it was just like that. Twirl, twirl. These tongs, I just touched it like this with my finger and they just melted down. Wow. You know, I can't, I'm not like, this is not my talent bending. So it's not one, I'm not one of these people, but I do have a friend, Fran, who that, you know, you give her anything. We gave her, a, she had a steel rod and she could just bend it. She said, I didn't know I could do this. So this was like, 
a very, you know, uh, successful woman, big in corporate business and other things. And she studied things of the paranormal, but she wasn't like sitting there trying to become a vendor. She just had a natural talent for it or whatever you want to call. And like the lady that was sitting behind me. Yeah. So um, we did, we have tried, you know, I remember coming back and us taking out the silverware because this was years ago. And my kids and everybody and us trying, and I don't remember what if we had, I don't think we had, I don't know if we had any successes really, but we did try it a couple months ago after a gaming, just to the fun of it. And my husband's fork bent over like that. I don't have it with me. He has it in his office because he was so blown away that this, this happened. And we just did that little thing in a group and all the rest of us, nothing happened to our fork or spoon, but his was bent completely over. So I can't really give you, but you can go online. And I, Jack's last name was, I think, H-O-U-E-C-K, something like that. That's where I think you will find your most reputable information on spoon bending. What about table tipping? What's table tipping? Now, table tipping, <laughs> I don't know if it was the 1868 or somewhere in that time period in Europe, a lot of people were using table tipping as a form of speaking to spirits. But there was a lot of charlatans out there that were rigging tables and doing things where tables really weren't actually spiritually being moved or whatever. They yeah. were really trick, it was really trickery. But amongst that, there were actual people who were experiencing real table tipping. And um I had not, it was not something I ever ventured into, but again, we were at another conference. It might've been the parapsychology conference. I don't know if this was the IRVA. I think this was a scientific and parapsychology conference. And they were showing video of a, a gentleman in Russia doing table tipping. And he was like a little short kind of stout guy. And he's doing like this, and the table's lifting and moving and you're seeing the video. You know, you're seeing a video, so if you want to be skeptical, you can say, well, I don't know if it's real or whatever. But the audience that was watching this, you know, respected the person who was presenting it. And in the audience was my friend Stanley Krippner, who um, has done many studies about dreams, and he's quite an amazing man. He was with a friend, and when the friend saw the table tipping, he said, Stanley, when we get back to San Rafael, we got to try this table tipping thing. So I get a phone call from Stanley saying, we're, we're starting a table ticket tipping group and we'd like you to join us if you'd like to join us. So it was me, him, the man whose house it was that wanted to do this, his wife and a French medium. And that's how our group originally started. And then after we were doing it for about a year, a two scientists ended up joining us, ha uh, Harry and Beverly. And uh, they started doing scientific things and writing up statisticals and taking temperatures in the room and doing all scientific things with the table tipping, where we were just doing, you know, casual experience of it. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, so I didn't know what to expect for this because, you know, I saw some of the things about, you know, things that were written back, you know, 100 years ago. And I called up my friend, Jean Millay, but not till after I had done it, I think, or I'm not sure if it was before or after it. Like, I didn't know what to expect or what to do when I got there. So we'd sit around this very heavy table. We all touched our hands together and we would play like happy music and lively music. The lights would be off, the windows were all shut, the blinds were all closed. We were in the lower part of this nice home. And we would start having different things in the beginning. The table didn't move right away. It took, I think, five sessions maybe, where we would just sit, you know, and we'd be doing this. And then we started finding that when we laughed and we like ignored the whole thing, that's when things started to actually happen. So I believe, I can't tell you exactly, but the experience we had in numerous different sessions was spirits coming to us that could even be described by the people as they entered into the room. And there would be things we would see about the persons 
And so when two people have their eyes closed and they're both seeing the same kind of an image, you feel like we might be getting, you know, we're touching onto something here. Well, the table started to like rock, like slowly like this in the beginning, like not with a whole lot of, you know, and like just sort of kind of tilted. And it was a very heavy table, like 20 something or 30 pounds, it was heavy. And as we did more sessions and more sessions, that rocking started to go like this into, you know, really back and forth where it felt like it could really hurt one of these people who might be a little more fragile in their eighties, their knees or legs as the table kept coming down so hard that way. So we decided we wanted to try and see if we could film it. And we put, I put like day glow uh, sticks on the table so that you would see them moving in the darkness. Yeah. Um, and we, um, and I have video of it, but it's, it, it's not correct video because a skeptic could just say anything. So it's not something I, you know, put up or shared or anything, but I decided to turn the light on during one of it. So I do have this video of us laughing hysterically and this table going up and down, but you can't really see all the arms and the people. So anyone could just say somebody's doing that, but I can tell you I was there and nobody was doing that. <laughs> That's and amazing things started going on in the room, like the temperature would get very hot and then all of a sudden it would get very cold and there would be, a, we started to put a candle in the middle of the table. So like it would evolve to something more in each session. We'd meet like once a month, you know, so it wasn't like we were doing this intensively, you know, it was a once a month visit. And in the beginning, it seemed like we'd sit there for 30 minutes before there'd be activity. After we ended up all connecting and this happening so often, we'd sit down and within eight or 10 minutes of sitting there, the activity would happen. So we decided to try a smaller table that was lightweight and looked more like the tables in those pictures you see in the uh, papers about this from you know 1870 or 90 or whatever it is. And we put this candle in the middle and when the table started going, the candle flew across the table. The wax went all over the guy that was sitting there. And, mm -hmm. and you know, these were like, you, you, know, you know, after that, we said, all right, no more candle in the middle, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so funny. Said, before COVID, but I wasn't a, you know, a, I, I lived, a, you know, I had to drive almost an hour and a half or more at night. So as winters would come on, I wouldn't go there as, as much as the people, they all lived a few blocks from each other. So it was easy for them to, to get together. So I didn't get to be there for every single one they did. I missed a whole lot of them because it was just too far a drive to do at night. You know, it'd be raining a lot or that day or whatever. So um, every anyway, time I kept coming question. back. Do yeah. you were actually seeing spirits enter the room? Like, do you think it was the spirits lifting the table? This is where I don't know the answer to, except your mind, you know, like each, each one of us had an experience there where I felt the spirit of someone that one, the other medium that was there of a son, her son's friend had committed suicide like that week or whatever. And everything I described was exactly her son's friend. And I don't know her or her son or his friend so yeah. I can't tell you where that information came from that all of a sudden I'm feeling like a young guy and I'm, and I'm saying these things about women and music and, you know, so I, uh, I, I can't, I can't tell you except for the verification of the woman across there saying, oh my God, you're co completely uh, in touch with so-and-so, whatever his name was. And was that the purpose of it? I mean, besides seeing the table, no. was it, was it, was the purpose of getting insight? No, the purpose was to see whether a table could be raised directly straight up. Which we, never did it, we never had it directly straight up. We had it always tilting like this. Yeah. When we switched to the smaller table, you know, and you have your hands like this on the table, the smaller table started moving around the room, but our bodies were like in the way. It was like walking on, you know, like walking around. So we would keep stretching and trying to keep up with the table <laughs> around the room. I can't give you any, I'm just telling you what I experienced. I can't give you any scientific reason, whether it was spirits moving it or what exactly is going on. I have no idea. 
except that I saw us be able to develop uh, 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 the abilities for this to happen as we spent more and more visits together, it got stronger and stronger. And we started to learn things like, who knew that when you had happy music on, that seemed to make the, you had to have a happy environment and that seemed to make the activity begin. More so than if you just sat there totally in quiet silence and nobody said a word, we didn't see much activity then. But when we started telling jokes and laughing and being, you know, like that, it's like all these things would start happening. Yeah, I, I, I want to get your opinion. Like, what do you think? Like, from your, from your, from all your years of psychic work, and and obviously, I know I've listened to other podcasts you did preparing for this. I heard your stories about you having premonitions of people dying, and what I I, I don't know if I necessarily want to hear about that, but I want to get your opinion on what you think the whole death thing is about and do you think we reincarnate and do you what do you do you think spirits exist and what's your whole idea on death in the afterlife thing i don't necessarily prescribe to any religion i would say i'm more spiritual so i do believe that our we are but maybe what energy and energy continues on and maybe we reincarnate i can't remember any past lives can you do you, what do you to say about all this okay i have I, I did experience near death when I was 21 years old and I was giving birth to my daughter and I nearly died. And I had an experience where I couldn't talk, but I felt like everything was okay and I was gonna give birth to this child. And I'm looking at all the people around me and trying to say to them, I'm okay, I'm okay, why do you look like this? But nothing's coming out of my mouth. And I'm in this place that the doctors call the woods. So like you're in between dying and maybe not gonna die or whatever. And in that place, it was filled with like flowers and music and song and light. And it just felt like a joyous place that I was in. Not, so I wasn't associating that I was in there because I was about to, that I was about to die and stroke out or whatever during this pregnant, during this birth. So, I'm having that experience, not knowing that this is like touching into the other side. When I give birth 13 years later to my next child, all I have is regular birth with the pain and the pushing and the whole thing. And there's no lights, there's no music, there's no... <laughs> yeah. It's just real birth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that is thing that I was floating around looking in, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So I saw the difference of what was happening to me. It wasn't like a dreamlike state. I was in the dying place. Yeah. But I have to say it was a very nice place where I was. I'm not saying that that's what it is. I don't know. But I'm just hey, saying wherever I went to at that time was a nice place. Can I say this? You've also had out-of-body experiences too. So do you think, but from you having out-of-body experiences, does that tell you that we have something more than our physical Well, body? to me, that birth was an out-of-body experience. I was out-of-body watching it all happening. Um, I, I, I was exposed to, you know, I had a, we had a Hindu monk as a babysitter and part of the commune we lived in in 1962. So I was exposed to meditation and yoga and all this stuff back in 1962 when I was seven years old. And he did a lot of, um, uh, he would go into such deep meditation trance that there would be no, I used to run in there and pretend like there was a fire because I couldn't believe as a kid that somebody could be that still and not respond to anything. I remember us running in there trying to trick him that, oh, there's a fire, there's a fire. and he wouldn't move, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I- and he was I, your babysitter? Yeah, yeah, he lived with us in a commune. We lived in a oh. vegan commune. Oh, that's and cool. had a different job. So he was sort of a, he would watch us sort of as a babysitter some of the time. Yeah. Anyways. Um, you must have had really open-minded parents. Like. I had very unconventional parents, but that is a whole nother show. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I think that's awesome though. You know? Oh, oh I, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful for the life that because you got, to learn, you got to learn all the things about all I'm just learning about now at 40 years of age. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll say I started learning at 36, but I used to listen to, you know, the Art Bell show when I was growing up and that had, it was a lot of alternative subjects, but then my dad's hero was Art Bell. He was an Art Bell fanatic. He loved yeah, him. He, he was the pioneer. He was, he was one of the, he was one of the greatest, you know, 
Um, yeah. I, I always yearn for the old days, you know, like I, I'm only 41, but I, I like the 80s, you know what I mean? And 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 then my parents told me about the 60s and, and uh, you know, they, they seemed like more uh, easier times, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I mean, I, I, it's hard to explain because there weren't people weren't having as much as equal rights or anything like that and that but i mean it seems like we have more um uh chaos in society today and it's not it has nothing to do with people's rights or anything like i'm just talking about in general just the, the way society is maybe it has something to do with technology or i can't really put my finger on it as to why we're so divided we're divided politically we're divided um racially we're divided spiritually people to all subscribe to different religions and i think religion's a joke you know i mean it's just uh i mean i'm like i said i'm spiritual i believe in a creator a god but i don't i think religion's man-made and i think it's just you know so well, just to, i, I want to answer your question about the death and my father raised us atheists he'd come from um a very a, a religious jewish background and my grandparents lived in our house and kept a kosher home, but we lived upstairs and we were vegans, uh, vegan atheists. So that wasn't very popular in 1962, I can tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I wanted to answer my, your question about the death. All I can say is because of the influence I've, I've had, as I was saying about the Hindu and you know, having a, you know, a shaved man in robes and beads meditating at that early age, and learning a lot about different Buddhist things later on. I think, that, I'm not sure about reincarnation. I just am not sure. I don't think that it's not real. I'm just not sure how the process really occurs. What I am sure of for my being, I'm not saying this is the world's answers or anything, is something lives on after you die. The body dies. But something else, I don't know if, like you were saying earlier, if it's energy, I don't know if it's consciousness, I don't know if it's electromagnetic fields, I don't know what it is. But I'm sure that something goes on because I'm not contacting the wrong number here. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, you're contacting people. You're, you're, something you're, you're, is, yeah. And, and, but I don't know if it's their essence or their, you know, I do shamanic things, and in shamanic things, you're you're contacting with spirits and you're working with spirits. And for me, I I have seemed to have my my medium thing seems to be that I can somehow fall into contacting someone who has passed on. It doesn't happen each time. I don't know how it'll be, but sometimes it's a very strong thing. Sometimes I physically feel I start doing the thing that the person. And they, I say to the person, I don't know why, but I. I'm tilting my head to the side and I feel like I got to keep like this while we're discussing this person. And she says to me, oh, that's what she always did when she was thinking. She would always tilt her head to the side. So there are things that make you feel like, how can I not, where would this come from, this information? You know, strange things. So it's not like I get a whole history or any of this kind of thing. It's just a few things, but it makes you feel inside like you've really touched something. And I don't really, I really don't know what that word is. Consciousness, uh, essence, their energetic field, the memory of their past. I don't know, but something definitely, my, my, my personal feeling is I once was in a retreat with the man who wrote the book, the Tibetan book of living and dying, which was the Western form. It was done by Sogil Rinpoche. And it was a huge crowd, 400 people were there and I was sitting on the floor in front of him. And I just had to ask him, are you ever afraid of dying? Because he's a Buddhist, right? And I felt what an amazing man, he told the truth, which he says, yes, sometimes I'm completely filled with the fear of death. And it gave me such relief to feel that whenever I have sometimes an anxiety moment, like, oh my God, what if I died? I wouldn't see my grandchildren or this wouldn't go on. I wouldn't be here to help people and la, la, la. I, don't, I wouldn't really want to die. I'm, I'm stricken with fear. What if I left tomorrow, you know? And that calmed me forever to always know in my mind that in the human nature, even with a person who's so highly um, 
evolved in areas of death and reincarnation, even they too may have an anxiety moment of the idea of facing their own immortality and their death. But it's really what I believe is the body is what dies. Yeah, I do too. Not, I, I just, not the rest I just, of it. I, I need reassurance. I mean, I had some guy from the Robert Monroe Institute and he had he did studies on reincarnation and death and stuff like that. And I've had so many people that have had NDEs and OBEs on my show. People not some not people as psychically advanced as yourself, but along the lines, and they always reassure me. But then the next day, like you said, I could have that anxiety that, oh shit, I'm gonna die and this is all gonna be over. And what's my purpose? And you know what I mean? And you can really go down a you can really go down a uh, uh, rabbit hole. Track of, yeah, rabbit hole of mind thinking that isn't nice. It's not, you know, I mean, I guess that's why it's good to stay entertained with whatever you like to do, you know. I, I mean, for me, I like I to do this. I like to create. I, I, have, I have three grown kids, ages 25 to 44, and I always tell them, don't you worry, I'm coming back. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, you'll be in the house and I'm going to be coming to see you. So just be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> That's I do funny. feel also that spirit comes back. I mean, my experience is I've had this experience and I know many people have. It's just, again, getting them to admit it or talk about it. We're after a death a certain animal or bug or something will come into their life and they'll feel like it's their husband or it's their brother they lost or whoever it is. I have one friend who, she said, yeah, my husband came back. It's that goose. Then ever I think about him, the goose flies into my yard. For me with my father, it's a hawk. And it, it, it came and presented itself to me. And I just know that somehow this is, my father's way of communicating to me. Well, I'm out in my garden here. I live in 15 acres in an orchard and I'm out there and I'm having something that was really bothering me. And I wished my father was still here to help me talk about it and get through whatever it was. So I just hold my hands up to the sky and I said, dad, wherever you are, I really need you right now. And then the hawk comes out of nowhere. And so there's this feeling of connection, like, well, you can't just command a hawk to come out of nowhere, but this one did. So I feel that there are things like this that people have experienced and know inside that somehow this has been a response to them reaching out to someone's spirit or consciousness or energetic place to connect with them. That's amazing. And the last thing I'll ask you about is um, your, your shamanic initiation and walking barefoot on hot coals. I'd like to hear about okay. that. Okay, so there's two different things here. The shamanic initiation, well, I, I, I don't even know if we'll be able to get to that. I'll tell you about the hot coals first. The shamanic initiation happened. I made a mistake there. It's uh, 2011. So this is my 10-year anniversary since the Mongolian Buryat shamanic initiation. But first, let me tell you about the hot coals because that had nothing to do with the shamanic initiation. And I have a fun story to go with that one. There's this woman who, I was involved in a conference called uh, the Shamanism Conference, and it has been on for, it was on for over 35 years. And this is where I got exposed to so many different shamans in the world, and it's where I ended up with all my connections of shamans I have. So if not for that conference, I would probably have only known the shamans in the Weechol Indians that I worked with when I had cancer but I wouldn't know any of these other ones. And now I have a whole collection of people of shamans from all over the world. And I always invite them to come to my house. So one of these women who presented was from Siberia, Russia and Siberia, very tall, beautiful woman, Latimira. And after the conference, we would have smaller events at my house because I had a room that we could do any of these different kinds of things in with say 15 people, you know, not like a big conference, but just small intimate workshops. So we would have things afterwards where people would come and have other experiences with these shamans. And we did, we've had all kinds of different lovely events there. So she says she wants to do walking on hot coals. <laughs> and I'm like, walking on hot coals, okay, you know. She had us, she blindfolded us. We had to walk around our or, my orchard with his trees and branches and all things that could poke your eyes out. 
but somehow we were blindfolded and through her guidance was able to walk around the orchard, all these people without getting hurt. So when she said she wanted the hot coals, my son, Richard, who loves fire and anything to do with fire, he said, I, okay, I'll make you a bed of coals. And she wanted like a strip, you know, like, I don't know, maybe it was 10 feet long and about three feet wide or four feet wide and, you know, about 10 feet long, something like that. So it looked like a little strip, you know, just like that, a rectangle. And she had him start the coals. They went for, he started with the wood and it had to, it was hours of work for him to like keep flattening it down and making it so that was all hot coals. And they kept saying, Rich, you're going to do this, right? You're going to go across the coals with us. And he said, oh, yeah, mom, I'm going to do this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's there. And he was also the person to make a film and take pictures of it. I was just talking about this today. So I wonder where those photos are. And so he's down on the ground where the coals are really hot. So he can see how burning they are. And the shaman, Latimira, has everybody line up behind her. And she's going to show us how to run across hot coals at night barefoot and that we're not going to get burnt or anything's going to happen. So I'm first a little bit timid about this, you know, I'm like, I don't know, I, you know, if you just take a little match head, it hurts when it burns on you. How could I really do this? So she runs across with the first person and they're exhilarated and they're not burnt and nothing has happened. And I'm not really quite ready yet, but all of a sudden she just grabs my arm and I'm running across coals. And you feel like when you get across it, like this very elated joy feeling, I don't know why, but you, energetically you feel incredible. So I run across it and then I realize I'm not burnt. So I say, Rich, you got to do this. He says, nah, I'm not doing this. <laughs> He's very, very hot coals. He said, I cannot do this. So instead he just watched, took the pictures and tended the coals. And we continued to go over and over across the coals excuse me, grabbing the hand of another person. You know, it was sort of like one of those things you did as kids where you went around in a circle and you'd go through the, you know, the, the pe people's hands or whatever, but instead you were running across these, these, these hot rocks. Not hot rocks, hot coals. So I do not know what goes on. I don't know what happens. I do have, I have heard of people who have gone and attended these things and have, have burnt their feet, have gotten hurt in them. I don't know if it's the magic of the shaman. I don't know if she knows just the way to run. I don't know because if you just place your foot on a little coal for a second, it's very burning. So yeah, I'm not sure yeah. why in that you do not experience that. And I can guarantee you from my son, these were very hot coals. So people say, what was the effect of that? And I said, I can only tell you the story that happened to me the next morning. I woke up, we did this at night. It felt, you felt powerful afterwards, a feeling of power of whatever kind of power I can't explain. And I had offered to take our, vis our visiting guests on a treat for horseback riding at the ocean. And I thought this would be something they would enjoy. This is something different. I myself don't go on horses and hadn't been on one, you know, I mean, a few times in my life, terrified, but I've been on a horse. So I have a great respect, like I do for the ocean, for a horse that that's in, they're in charge, not me. And I'm very afraid that, you know, they're much bigger and I don't know what to do with these. But that day I felt like really calm and centered in a way I had not been before. So I didn't approach the horse scared like I normally am. We get on the trail and it's like six horses, you know, with the, my, my friends, my uh, shaman's friends. And then the guy who takes you and we s go across the road and we get into the part where we're getting into the ocean, where we're going to start galloping gently or just gently going across in the sand. And you're in a perfect straight line. This is how you have to do it. And all of a sudden, the horse I'm on just collapses completely to the ground. Oh, my God. And I think in my mind in that second, he's had a heart attack. I'm too fat. <laughs> Must have killed her. <laughs> <laughs> and the people behind me <laughs> in, in that quick second are thinking, oh my God, her leg is going to be crushed. She will be, we have, you know, they're just seeing that the horse is going to just roll over my leg and my foot is in the stirrups, right? 
well, I had presence that I've never had where no fear came at all. I looked like a professional horse person. The horse dropped to the, to, to, to the, to the ground. I just pulled my foot out of the stirrups, jumped off as he was ready to you know, go straight this way. And instead of having my leg crushed, I was standing next to a horse. Wow. I'm telling you, I could have never done that before this coal thing. We're running on that coal. Did you feel the horse collapse in there? Were you able to feel out the whole situation? You know I what I mean? Like, went, I, like to... I flowed with it. Like I was yeah. there as present as, and like I'd been on a horse a hundred times or something. What ended up happening with the horse? So the women, the people behind me are, first their mouths are hanging open because they can't believe something didn't happen because it's a split second when you see that, right? Yeah, that's amazing. And I tell the guy, have you ever heard of anything like this before? And the, the guy's just like the leader of the trail. So he doesn't know anything about this. I have no fear to get back on the horse again. And when we get back to the stables an hour later after the ride's over, I go to the people in charge and say, you know, I could have been very hurt today. Do you know what happened? Why this horse dropped to the ground like that with his legs straight down into the, you know, done. And she said, oh my God. She said, you must be a very spiritual person. I said, what? <laughs> she said, I mean, she didn't know I'd been walking on hot coals the night before. Yeah. She said, horses have a time of the season where they sort of shed a little, where they fur their hair or whatever's on them that gets very itchy. And he said, but they never do this with a person on them. They drop to the ground and in the sand, the horse was like rubbing its belly to get the scratching in on the, oh. on the thing. And that's all he was trying to do. She's, but they never do that with a person on. And it's a very rare thing to see that. I said, well, this horse picked me for that. <laughs> and I said, I'm glad it wasn't because I was too fat, you know? <laughs> Anyhow. Um, I, 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 I know I, uh, I must say that was my last question, but I just have two more. Because right? you're such an amazing person. I feel really blessed to have you here. And oh, I, I know, we've already been going an hour. I, I, I really, this is an awesome podcast. Um, I just want to ask you about Woodstock real quick and then your battle with cancer. Like, and I know those can be both real long stories, but yeah, I still, I think it's important we get it to the audience. Okay. We, okay. I'll try to make them short, but I'll do the cancer first and the Woodstock second, because I'd like to end on a happy note instead yeah. of a cancer talking note, <laughs> even though it's a happy thing because I'm still here today. Yeah. How did you beat cancer? Yeah. So, in my, in my early 30s, I think I must have been like 32 or something. You know, I'm, I'm never exactly right on these, but the audience doesn't care. Uh, I'm like 32 or something like that. And I go and have a pap smear. And part of my unconventional life in the family I grew up in was the fact that um, we were raised with no dentists and no medical interference. So we were never given an aspirin or, you know, my, if we were sick, you were put on a fast of water and that's how you healed yourself. So I wasn't raised with cough syrup or any of this kind of things. Yeah. So yeah. you have to understand um, coming from a mentality where my father raised us to believe that if you ever went to doctors or hospital, they'd kill you or you die from them. So, which is why I nearly died during that birth because I'd never seen a doctor the whole nine months of my pregnancy and I was rushed to a hospital because my dad was delivering the baby and the baby wasn't coming so <laughs> but that's that part of that story so when they said that I had uh, they thought I had signs of cancer when they did the pap smear they said you need to have a biopsy and you need to do all these things I didn't believe that because of my father's upbringing. I thought, oh, it's another test. They just said it, so they want to make money. And he told me how most of the things were they did it to make money, to you know, make you buy drugs and la, la, la. So I figured, eh, I don't really have cancer. I'm 30-something years old. This must be a whatever. My friends who were traditional girls who were raised with families that took them to doctors did not believe that. They knew I must have cancer and I should take care of it, but I didn't. I went off to Mexico and I, I, I had been told by the doctor that I should have this cancer taken care of. You know, I need to have the biopsy and I need to be taken care of. And 
30 days and la la la. And instead I went to um, the mountains of Mexico to be with the Huichol Indians who I had been with previously in another visit. And this is a very remote area at nearly 10,000 feet elevation. There's no other white American women walking around. I dress as a Huichol when I'm there. And I'm, I'm, I've been involved with this particular group of people since that time. And that's how much our love, and it's a family for me, the families of people that I know there. So I say to my friend, I'd like to get a healing from the shaman. So the shaman, his name is Nietzsche, Nietzsche. He came and he's doing his, you know, thing. I had not known much about shamanism then. And he's doing the feathers on me and he's doing the deer tails and He's, they, and so often uh, it's motion, it looks sort of like a sucking up where they're like sucking the disease or thing out of your body. And they're going around your body doing this. And he gets down to my crotch and he's got his, his thing down there and he's, he's sucking up and he tells my, my friend in Huichol who translates it to me in Spanish. And then I got to figure it out in my terrible Spanish, what they're saying to me. And what he was saying was that I had like, a hard substance down there and that it needed to come out. So when this shaman who didn't use any kind of medical tests or blood tests and didn't know that I was, had, was dealing with this issue, tells me this in that evening, I realized it's true, I really had cancer. But I was in the mountains of Mexico with a tribe of people that don't speak a word of English and my Spanish is, you know, mas o menos. So I was crying and I became terribly depressed and I was sitting at the like top looking over their sacred ceremonial grounds area and I just felt like I'm gonna die now and I didn't believe this could be for a 32 year old that this is what I was gonna have to deal with. And my friend Miguel, his father, who was considered one of the most respected Weecholes because he was so traditional and he lived to 105, I think, or something. He was an amazing soul. And he brought me something and it was in a mortar and pestle. And so it was just like in the little cement bowl part. And he gives me a tortilla and he tells, he shows me with his hands that I should eat this stuff he made me. So I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, oh, maybe it's dried beef jerky or, or not beef jerky, deer jerky. And he's powdered up this jerky or something. I take the stuff with the tortilla. I eat it, trusting this man who even we cannot communicate with, you know, English or much Spanish. And for the next four days, my depression is gone. I feel like Wonder Woman, like I've been given every nutritional vitamin I could possibly get. And I'm very grateful this, for this experience. But I realized that I have to go home to the doctor and I have to have a um, biopsy to find out about the cancer. Well, uh, I find out maybe a year later that what I had eaten was the dried blood of the deer that's caught sacred and ceremonially and deer are very rare up there in the mountains to find because they've been you know, hunted so much. I always wish they could take the deer here. We have so many extras, you know, and bring them down there in a truck and release them into the mountain. Yeah, I'm from, I'm from Pittsburgh and it's the same thing. I'm like an East Coast person myself and it's it's it's, it's insane. We have so many. Right. And, and they, they, they bring wine that. disease and everything, you know, like it's like... No, it's, it's an important, like, you know, it's an important like God-like thing in their culture. The deer, the, the peyote, yeah. the sun, you know, these are all very important things. So... Um, uh, I forgot where we were. Oh, you ate the deer blood. Oh, the blood, yes. So I came back and I had the biopsy and they said that I had the kind of cancer that might spread to the rest of my body. And I did all these different holistic things before I would be agreeing to having the surgery. So I did... Uh, fasting on water. I did, I went and did a Vipassana retreat with Joseph Goldstein up in Hawaii with only 30 people. And we did silent meditation 12 hours a day, all day long, walking and sitting. So I was doing all the spiritual healing 
And then I did this shamanic healing. And then I decided I had to do the Western medical and get it out of me because my friends were telling me you're going to die if you don't get rid of your cancer. So when the doctor, who was a friend of mine's family friend who did the surgery, when he went to do the surgery in San Francisco, after it was over, he came to me and he said, and you never hear doctors be that honest or open, but he was really a very gentle, kind man. And he said, I just want to tell you, I don't know what you did with your Indians, but you did something. He said, because a skin encapsulated the entire tumor in your body and sealed it all off so it never spread to your other organs. And I just was able to take out the tumor and, you know, uh, put in some stitches and you go home and, you know, you have to rest for a few weeks and everything will be fine. That's amazing. I wow. ended up having two more children after that, even though I was told by doctors I would not be able to ever conceive any other children. I had been 13 years and never conceived another child. After I had this cervical cancer removed, I had two more children, one in my third, my son when I was 35, at home in a bed with a midwife, delivered a perfect, beautiful child. He looked like the Buddha. And my daughter I had at 41 years old and delivered at, at home in a bathtub underwater with a doctor. I was considered a high risk pregnancy because of the time I, when I was 21 and nearly died. I had toxemia and preeclampsia. And I was considered um, because of cervical cancer that they cut out a lot of my cervix that how would I hold a baby? And they said, <clears throat> what they do is they stitch you up so that if you, you, you can hold the baby, it doesn't fall out, should that happen? That did not happen in either case. I still had only about half my cervix. I still gave birth to two beautiful children in two different at-home ways. There was no drugs of any nature used with, I think olive oil was the most thing we used. And I gave birth to two beautiful children who got to be born at home, one underwater and one in my bed. That's amazing. That's part of your story. I think that's what I think. That, I think that's what this life, this earth is. I think it's a school, and we learn lessons. And we have people like yourself, like me, like who tell stories. Like, and yeah, you happen to have amazing stories. And people like me, and people like other people from the world can learn from them. And that's why I think. People like you are, you know, like you, you know, like you, you, you can teach people about health. You can teach people about spirituality. You can teach people about meditation. You can teach people about psychic. I mean, you're, you're an amazing person. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. It was like, it was, uh, it was really, uh, it was, uh, it was really mindful. You know, well, you're very sweet. <laughs> I don't it's think awesome. of myself like that, but I did step out of my realms and I did start a podcast September 1st and the whole title of my my podcast and my goal there is sharing stories that heal that's so awesome. that, that's my little route that I'm on and I'm hoping that you know by being on shows like yours and whatever it is if even just one person of all your viewers got something out of our talk together then I think we accomplished something yeah. And that's what, that's what for me, like it's all about. And also, you know, there's different ways of serving and helping others. And so if there's any way that that comes through in any talks that I do and sharing it, you know, some people wouldn't share and be as open as I am about my stories or the things that have happened, but I feel like an open book and I'm ready to share all of it with everybody because I have nothing to hide. Yeah, that's amazing. My last question for you is, we can talk real quickly about Woodstock. Now, did you see the Rolling Stones with the Hells Angels? And what was that like? No, they were not at Woodstock. You I got thought the they wrong. were at Woodstock. No, they were at, um, what was it called? It was here in California. And it was after Woodstock. But I can't remember the name because sometimes it's hard to remember the names of things from way long ago. It Might come up. A. It started with an A. I know that because I looked it up. Not to Altamont, yeah, was, yeah. yeah, Altamont, and there was a lot of violence and th no, this was Woodstock was um, three days that ended up actually going into Monday, which made it four days. But we, I was there for two days, the Saturday and Sunday. I had just turned fourteen years old. I went with four of my favorite guys that were older than me, and it was I was like their little sister, so they always protected me and took really good care of me. 
And um, in fact, recently, one of them, we just found each other and we hadn't been able to find each other for 40 years. So we've been having like a Woodstock reunion together. It's really been a beautiful thing. That whole Woodstock thing of remembering that we are one and that we are all connected. That was a live experience of we are one. Yeah. And the experience there, I've never had that again since that. I've never been with half a million people in very uncomfortable situations with no water and no bathrooms and no roads where you could go in and out and rain pouring down on you. I mean, everything that you could imagine that would make it an unpleasant thing for people to get angry or upset or pissed at each other. Instead, it was days of just loving, flowing, beautiful energy. And a we are oneness, a real we are oneness. And, and that was at a time when, you know, like my father was in the Vietnam War, you know, yes. I, I, and I can't remember what years he was in it, but I know he was in it for a decent amount of time. And I think he, he did at least a four year term because I think that's what you had to do back then. And I think he, I, I can't remember if he was out at 69. I, I would have to check. I have his photo book, but um, that coming together and we are one was to battle the Vietnam War, right? The, yes. the, the, what was going on in Vietnam? Because like they were seeing our boys get killed over there and nobody wanted that, right? Exactly. In fact, I'm going to hold up a picture that I don't know if you'll be able to see or your viewers will be able to see. This is a photo I took on my first roll of film ever um, on a 35 millimeter camera. And we didn't know we were making history. I have no pictures of me at Woodstock, except that I was in the Woodstock movie. So now I've been able to, which I found on the 40 year anniversary. So now I'm able to, to, to see myself there. But this is country Joe McDonald. And he's going to sing with the crowd, what they call, I feel like I'm fixing to die rag. And this was a Vietnam protest song. And when you hear, 400 to five, it was, it's always debatable. They say 400,000, half a million. I'm not sure what was there. I can just tell you it was a lot. And when you hear them all singing in unison in protesting the war in Vietnam, his song, it was an amazing, connective, powerful message sending out to the world. We don't want this war. And it was one of, you know, it's one of the highlights, you know, you remember certain things of the concert. And that was one of the highlights that I remember because everyone is singing the song together and everyone in their mind is saying, we are against the war. And it was very powerful. Yeah. I, I uh, you know, and but this whole sort of spirit feeling of free love and lovingness and all this, well, it's continued on for me when this woman who produced this book and the author who wrote it, he said I was the muse that helped him to finish the book. They invited me to be on their book panel. I went to Woodstock. I hadn't been to Bethel in 50 years. I went there in the year of the anniversary of going there back to where I hadn't been since then. And I made all these new wonderful friends just like it was the old days. I Are met the like one in the nineties or are there a reunion? Re 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 no, there one in the nineties. No, 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 no. I only went to the one in 1969 and I went there for the book release party oh, oh, okay. I thought NFL you were... in 2019. Oh, yeah, it was a 50 year really anniversary good. celebration and some of the bands came, but I had adopted this beautiful dog uh, from a rescue dog who weighs 87 pounds and he knocked me through the air like a bowling ball and a pin. <laughs> and I, yeah, and I was laid up on my, with my leg oh, and I wasn't oh, going to so I didn't go for the 50 year celebration, but I did get to go to the museum and meet all these people. And I'm in the archives of the museum. They've filmed me, they've recorded me, they've written so that uh, they keep archives of attendees. So I'm in all of those things now and all because of this woman inviting me and this gentleman for, to interview me, Dan Buxman, who wrote the book. See, so I'm, one became thing, my, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. They yeah. became my friends, all these people. So I have new friends in my life and it all had to do with Woodstock again. 
And and why I wanted to cover this is because I you know I look at the demographics of the people who watch my show. A lot of the people that watch my show are like you know 25 years old, and I'm 40. You know what I mean? So I understand Woodstock a little bit more. There was a Woodstock in my generation. It wasn't no nowhere nearly as powerful as yours because the, your Woodstock was about fighting against oppression against war, which is a, a message that needs to get handed on for generations and generations because we're still dealing with nuclear weapons. We're still dealing with these false flag type events that go on. And I could go on about this forever, but we're still dealing with a cabal that is in charge possibly that wants to see us down. And I, I think we all need to come together and I want to pass this message on. That's why I wanted to talk to you about what's on. Well, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just, I just did a podcast that since you have a young generation, if they end up looking me up, a small, medium at large podcast with Gail Heisen, they have to look for the Gail Heisen because there are other ones with that same title, or maybe you post it on your site. Are the gentleman that I interviewed just this Wednesday, a couple days ago, it's a great story about here's a gentleman who's turning 89 but he tells you about the story of Mickey Hart and the Grateful Dead and how they met in the 60s. And uh, <clears throat> I think people that are young should listen to these people because these are elders and they're people that share stories that they will never get to hear unless they hear it from the mouth of these people who were around when my, my friend Jean Millay, which is a sh show I was on about her, she did the first light shows for the Grateful Dead. And, you know, these are, this is like, this is history of, yeah. of rock and roll. It's history that needs preserved. Yeah. Exactly. And it's, it's rock yeah, and roll. Yeah, exactly. History. It wasn't even like, yeah, for the, one, the reason. One last like, tidbit yeah. for so. your listeners. My hearing is so bad now from all my years of loud music listening because I was into rock and roll. When Janis um, Joplin, not, not Janis Joplin, when uh, Grace Slick played um, White Rabbit in Central Park, I stood in front of the speaker, giant speakers. We would wear headsets and blast the headsets of the music. The amount of the volume of loudness, you wanted only the biggest speakers you could get. Now the speakers are this little and they make amazing sounds. But when we grew up, it was the bigger speaker, the better. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Speakers on exactly. wheels that you could move them around and we'd sit there just, me and my husband, we just blast the music, just the two of us. The yeah. police came once because it was so loud and they saw there was no party, you know? <laughs> so I, I do recommend people don't do that because it did destroy my hearing. And now I'm getting to, you know, and I know where it came from because I, you know, we didn't pay attention then. And we had very, very loud sound and very loud rock and roll music, but it's what it was. And, you know, hopefully I won't need a hearing aid too soon. <laughs> I can share the same sentiment. We, we did the same thing growing up my generation too. We, it's the same thing. Like, and I, I tend to feel myself starting to get a little bit, but not, I, I mean, I start to, start to what it's hard to like i i not not hear people as good as i used to you know yeah. and, and uh i wonder if it's from that because we used to go to these parties my generation they were called raves where they were like uh in the 90s there were raves and they were like uh, they had them in new york they had them in pittsburgh everywhere did you I have a to, rave i have to say even as eight you know i'm, I'm 66 now so i'm no spring chicken but my husband was very dear friends with Timothy Leary and he was coming up from Beverly Hills where he was living and I had already met him at his home and we had a wonderful connection and he, he told my husband wasn't my husband then and he told him you should marry this woman I said I don't even want to be married <laughs> he said well then adopt her well he invited us to join him for this rave because he was being honored at with all his books and things by all the young generation and I know this meant I think that meant a lot to him but I had never been to a rave and I didn't know what to expect, but I was thrilled to go. Yeah. And um, uh, I think ecstasy was the thing. Everybody was all doing ecstasy. Yeah, it, it was one of them. The ecstasy, acid, you know. Yeah. Yes. And then you had to like, to get to the rave, it was like an address from another place and another place. And yes, that's how it used to be. That's yes, how it was, it was, a, was secret. in a secret it building a secret. in San Francisco. Yeah. And, you know, and we were there with the guests of the rave. 
So, and, and I'm watching all the young people and I'm thinking to myself, you know, I wasn't into, I didn't want to do any ecstasy or any of this, you know, I just wanted to see the experience. And that's where I met Anita Hoffman, who was Abby Hoffman's wife. And both her and Timothy, when I met Timothy was the day he found out that he wasn't going to have long to live. And when I met her was prior to when she was going to end up having to go for radiation treatments, of which I took her for one of her radiation treatments while she had cancer. So I sort of got to know these people only in the end of their life. But I, that rave was one of the very happy memories of me meeting her for the first time and us being with Timothy and being with all these young people in this hidden building somewhere in San Francisco. <laughs> That's how it used to be here in Pittsburgh. They used to have addresses, and you would have to get a flyer. They would have, they would pass out flyers in Oakland, which is a, the, it's a smaller part of Pittsburgh. And I remember us being, we would go skateboarding there because that's what was the thing then. And they would hand out flyers, and then you would have the flyer, and then you would have to try to find it. And it was in an abandoned warehouse somewhere. Like it was amazing times. I don't even know if they have that nowadays. I mean, they probably have legal ones somewhere now, but. Um, you know what? This was an amazing talk. I'm so glad I was able to meet you and talk to you. Like you are so awesome. I mean, how, where can everybody find you? Um, they can find me. Let's see. Do you have a book? You're me? about to put out a book, right? I'd like to No, I haven't found a publisher yet in case you have anyone in the audience that knows a publisher interested in this kind of a book. Um, they can email me at a small, medium, at large podcast at gmail.com. It's kind of long. Okay. I have a Facebook, I mean, a website, a small, medium, at large dot co, not com, in case yeah. they. And um, I don't know exactly how the podcast works, but I think it's, I think if you type a small, medium, at large, um, podcast by Gail Heisen or with Gail Heisen, as long as you see the Gail Heisen in it, H-A-Y-S-S-E-N, uh, -S -S then you know you're on the right one because there are a couple of other small, medium, at large, but they're not really currently doing shows, but they do come up when you type their name. Wow. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I'd like to keep in touch. I'd like to have you on the show again sometime. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And I'm so glad I'm making it to the young crowd. I hope you get some positive feedback when you post this. I, I, I will. I'll send you a link. I'll send you okay. a link. Okay. I look forward to it then. All right. Have a good night. All right.